when we sought out to plant a church, you know, not less than a year ago, we just prayed. We prayed. We didn't know. We said, God, just send us the people that you want to be here, that need to be here. Uh, and week in and week out, we are just floored and blown away uh, just by the people who attend, that come, that are, are diving in and jumping into this community that we have prayed for for so long uh, and are just praying for continually uh, as you walk this life out. Because I think it's important that you find a great community to join and link arms with, to do life with. Uh, because there's going to be moments where you're going to get discouraged, you're going to walk through difficult situations and challenges, and that's what the body of Christ is for, church community, is to come alongside you through those difficulties and through that pain. And honestly, that leads me, though, to this point right here that I want to talk to you. We've been in this series called I Love Jesus But Hate, and we've addressed just different issues such as hypocrisy, why does it seem like the church always talks about money? Allison last week preached a phenomenal message in talking about when it seems like your faith doesn't work. And I think we've all been there. We've all wrestled with that question before within our life. Uh, But today I want to talk about a topic that's tough to talk about. Uh, And the reality is, though, the topic that we will address is something that many people have experienced And through their experience, it's caused deep wounds, emotional scars on their heart and on their soul. And it's becoming an all too far common uh, topic of conversation. When people say, well, I used to go to church, but I had a terrible experience and I haven't been back since. Or recently, it's been rephrased as this, I was hurt by the church. You see, church hurt is a reality. And so that's what we want to tackle today is this idea that I love Jesus, but I hate church hurt. I'm going to tell you, I'm with you. I think we would all say that we would band together under this idea that we are against church hurt. But the thing is, church hurt is a real thing. It could be caused by church leadership, whether it be a pastor, staff member, a volunteer. It could be caused by someone that is in the church, just a member of the church, inside or even outside of the church. It could range from misunderstandings to intentional abuse. And unfortunately, it's becoming more prevalent. And if you're here today and you've been wrestling with the emotional pain and heartache resulting from negative church experiences that you've walked through. I first want to say that I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Because that's not the heart of God. What you experienced was not God's plan for the church. Now, I know that I can't represent every church leader in every church or even every church member that may have hurt you, but I can represent myself as a leader in the church and just say, I'm sorry. The challenge is, and I'll be the first to admit, though, that I'm imperfect as well. And I'm sure over my various 20 years of ministry, working from kids to youth to young adults to adults, I've probably caused some pain in people's life as well, unintentionally, because we are all imperfect people trying to serve a perfect Savior. But I do want to stand in representation and just say that I'm sorry, because I'm saddened by the number of stories that I hear about church hurt. There's a group that's called uh, by the name of Barna. It's called the Barna Group. And what they do is they do surveys for Christian religious organizations, and they look at religion as a whole, and they survey different countries, different people, just to kind of get the climate and the context of where Christianity is at. They did a survey recently that they said four out of 10 people that leave the church, walk away from their faith, or just abandon it altogether They say four out of 10 people leave because they were hurt by the church or they were hurt by someone within the church. And this could be your story. This could be your story where the church leadership let you down, whether it was an abuse of power, 
whether it's something they did intentionally within your life to, to, to scold you, to, to belittle you, to abuse their authority over you. It could be from people within the church that hurt you, that gossiped about you, that excluded you, that maybe they weren't there for you in your deepest time of need. Again, I want to tell you that it's not supposed to be that way. And the fact that some of you had to leave the church in order to find Jesus It's heartbreaking. The fact that some of you experience this deep emotional heartache and pain that should come from a place that represents God's healing and representation, which is called the church, honestly is evidence of the broken world that we live in today, as well as Satan's opposition for God's plan for your life. There's something that I constantly have to remind myself, and I think it's important that we remind ourselves for, is that the enemy has a plan for your life. He has a plan for your life to discourage you and to keep you from the things of God. And he lays it out in John 10.10. Jesus tells us what his plan is. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy It's simple. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And that is something that we constantly need to remind ourselves as we walk this faith journey out. When we go through things in this life, that we need to remind ourselves that the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. We need to be vigilant in what his plan is for your life. Because he knows that if he could eliminate the things of God within your life, the purpose, the plan, the community that he's bringing you into. He knows that if he can sideline you, that many lives will be affected by that. But here's the thing I want us to be reminded, that this opposition of church hurt taking place, it's not a new phenomenon. It's nothing new. Because it was the religious leaders that created this opportunity for Jesus himself to be beat and crucified. So if you're struggling with pain and heartache from actions from a church leader or fellow church member in or outside of the church, maybe one thing that could help us as we are leaning towards and finding hope and healing through what God has for us, that we could identify with Jesus himself. That Jesus identifies with your struggle, but more than that, he wants to help you heal. He doesn't want to leave you in this place, see you in this place of hurt and heartache. He wants to help you heal. Now, you might not be able to erase the memory of what you went through, but you can choose not to let it hold you back, that you can receive healing, that you can choose to be a part of an experience of a blessing of a church community and a church family that can love and that can see you through your healing so you can experience all that God has for you. As we remember Satan's mission is to steal, kill, and destroy, we need to remember what God's purpose is, is that he has come to give you life, that he has come to give you a purpose, that he has come to give you a plan. And the plan that you experienced through church hurt is not the plan that he had for you. That was the enemy's plan. But Jesus says that if you would just open yourself up to me, that I will help you experience the freedom that you need to experience because the enemy wants you to stay stuck in your pain and for you to give up on the church. But God wants to bring restoration and healing to your life because think about it, if the enemy can hinder and if if he can handicap you, he can keep you from the purposes and we never know what the ripple effect will be that it could have on one life. Imagine what the enemy can be robbing the kingdom of by keeping one believer sidelined because of the hurt and the pain that they've experienced. And that's why I believe that this issue is so important that we talk about, that we shed light on God's intentions on what the body of Christ is supposed to be. So I want to talk for a few moments and helping us understand how we can put ourselves in a position to receive the emotional healing that God wants to bring to our life. And the first way that we can position ourselves is this, is that you have to acknowledge your hurt. 
The first step in overcoming church hurt is to acknowledge that you have been hurt. It's important to recognize that your feelings are valid and it is okay to be upset. For some of you, you have to process what you experienced, whether it was recently or maybe it was when you were a child and you have been dealing for, it for, gener- for, for decades, you've been ex- experiencing this hurt and this pain that has held you back, that you have to process and understand that you have to acknowledge that you were hurt. The first mild marker into healing is feeling, is feeling it. That it's okay for you to, to be frustrated, to, to, to maybe even go outside and you might need to find yourself a place that's safe and say, God, that I've been hurt and you're acknowledging the hurt that you went through. Maybe it's a good cry that you need to have. Maybe you need to tell a trusted friend. You need to journal about it, your experience. Or maybe for some of you, you need to find a counselor to talk through the pain that you've experienced. But just don't ignore it. Yes, again, we need to process maybe what you experienced through the church hurt that you felt, but at the the same time, it's important that as we process it, once we figure out how we can get through it, we can't dwell on it. We cannot dwell on the pain that we've experienced because what I've found is that dwelling on hurt, it will consume you. To dwell means to live. And too often times we find believers living in that hurt, living in that pain where it has become all-consuming within their life, that they can't move forward, they can't figure out what God is trying to do in their life. They just, they're so consumed on what they experience that they're not willing to relinquish it and let God do something in and through their life. Dwelling on hurt can lead to bitterness and resentment which will cause you to distance yourself from God, from church, and from a good church, healthy community that wants to see you flourish in what God has called you to do. In Ephesians chapter 4, it tells us this. It says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Just in Christ, God forgave you. You know, a lot of times what happens is we often try just to move on without addressing the root cause of our struggles. But the truth is that we can't heal what we don't acknowledge. Acknowledgement is the first step to healing. Acknowledgement means accepting the reality of the pain and maybe the trauma that you experience and also the impact that that trauma has had on your life. It means being honest with ourselves and saying that we need to seek help We need to find help. But the great thing is that in the Bible, what we notice is that we see many examples of people who acknowledge their pain and sought healing. You think about Job. Job was an example how he acknowledged suffering and cried out for God to help. David, too, acknowledged his sin, and he sought out forgiveness. Jesus himself acknowledged the pain he was suffering. He would endure on the cross and willingly face it for the sake of our salvation. And here's the advantage that we have as believers The advantage is in acknowledging our pain. We have a God who understands our pain and is already and is always ready to comfort us and to heal us. Psalms 34, 18 tells us this, that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. We need to acknowledge that pain and we need to turn to God because he can bring us to a place of healing and restoration that he desires to see us walk out within our lives, but so often we hold on to that offense. We hold on to that hurt, and we don't try to heal it. And what happens is that we find ourselves trapped in our pain and in our hurt. You know, they say one of the hardest animals on the planet to capture is a ring-tailed monkey. It's somewhat like a, a lemur, and they actually say there's not very many of them that you find that are in captivity in public zoos around the world. But there's a story that goes on to tell how the locals were actually able to capture these monkeys. And what they would do is that they would find a tree and they would hollow just a small hole within the trunk of the tree. Just enough that the monkey could insert its hand into there. And what they've done is that they found these melon seeds that these ring-tailed monkeys like. And they put it in the trunk of this hole. And so as the monkey sniffs it, finds it, climbs around, it sticks its hands in this hole, grabs these melon seeds that they love so much, 
But now because it's in a fist, it cannot pull its hand out of that hole. And eventually, because the monkey has the love for this thing of not letting go of what it has in its hand, the captors or the trappers are able to come up behind the monkey, put it in a box, and put it in captivity. I think this could almost be spiritual resemblance for what we maybe experience in our life a lot of times, that there is something that we hold on to so tightly. I'm holding on to that hurt. That church hurt me. That pastor did this. And you may be valid in all of that, but we hold on to it so much that we are not going to let go of this offense, that we are not going to forgive. And all of a sudden, we are all consumed in these things, and we can't do anything. And what the enemy has done is he has come alongside you and trapped you in that moment so you can't move beyond the hurt and the pain, that you can't experience the freedom that God wants you to do. Because what has the enemy come to do? To steal, to kill, and destroy. And because we are not letting go of the hurt, we are not letting go of the pain, the enemy has done exactly that in the purposes of what God has for your life. So we need to acknowledge our hurt. We need to bring it to God. But we need to let it go and experience the healing process that God offers us through his love and through his forgiveness. We can't heal what we don't acknowledge. Second thing that we have to do is that we have to forgive with this caveat, with God's strength. Because you're going to need it. Anyone ever heard forgiveness already? I could feel probably just like, oh, great, he's going to talk about forgiveness. It seems like a simple thing. You can say, oh, you just got to forgive. But the act of doing it, oof, that's a challenge. One of the biggest things that you can do on your journey of healing is that you've got to choose to forgive. And in the mindset of this raw emotional pain, this, this doesn't come naturally for us. And it's overwhelming. And I know that even as I said that, walls have just kind of gone up, the tensions in the room about when we look at forgiveness. But please hear me out. You might be saying, Aaron, you don't know what I went through. You don't know the abuse that I experienced in this church or underneath that pastor. You don't know the trauma and the pain that it's caused within my life. I've been battling this for years. You say, you don't know. And so how can I forgive You can just easily say, well, just forgive, but I'm telling you, you're right. I might not know your church hurt. I might not know your pain, but I do know hurt. I do know what it feels like to be hurt within the church context. And I've encountered different experiences of my own as well as listened to stories of others who have walked through it itself, and it's heartbreaking. But as I mentioned before, that is not God's intention for the church, for you to experience. And it's just as much as it breaks my heart every time I hear stories of people being hurt in the church, through the church, from leadership, from church members, whatever it may be, it breaks his heart even more. It breaks God's heart even more. And if you were hurt through legalism or abuse hypocrisy, betraying of your trust, or any other reason, this was never God's plan. But you don't have to hold on to that pain. What I've learned that forgiveness, it's a supernatural thing. It's something that takes place supernaturally within you to be able to let go of that pain. And thankfully, God wants and expects us to rely on him in order for you to do it. Look what Mark eleven twenty five 25 says. It says, and whenever you stand praying, forgive If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Notice in the verse that Jesus encourages forgiveness in the context of what? Prayer. Forgiveness, true forgiveness, comes from a place where you are relying not on your strength to do it, It's relying on his strength to help you through it. And if there's ever a way for us to be able to open up and receive God's strength to forgive, 
when our flesh doesn't want to, because let's be honest, most oftentimes our flesh does not want to forgive, but it's through prayer. When you're struggling with forgiveness, you can pray for God to help you to forgive. And when you express that desire to do so, he will help you as you ask for help to forgive in those moments. He will give you that ability to walk it out because choosing to forgive is an opportunity for us to be more like Christ. Colossians 3.13 tells us to bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you have a grievance against someone, forgive as your Lord forgave you. Other translations talks about making an allowance for, for, for the things that have offended you or the offenses that are within your life, the faults that you've experienced. And what Paul's saying is that he's saying in church, you're going to have to bear with people. You're going to have to make allowances for people. You're going to have to forgive people. You're going to have to have grievances and go through some challenging things with people. And the thing, Paul wasn't talking about the people outside of the church. Paul actually wrote this letter to the church. And he's saying that we're going to have to deal with these things. And the reason why is because we are all imperfect people that make up the church. We all need forgiveness at points and times of within our life. And, and I think we are all, we all want it when we get to that place where we need to ask for forgiveness. We want people to forgive us. We want them to give us grace. But C.S. Lewis says this, everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until you have to forgive yourself. And it's so true. Many of you, you know the story of Corrie ten Boom. She was a Dutch Christian who, along with her family, helped many Jews escape the Nazi Holocaust in World War II. She wrote this book called The Hiding Place. And in this book are her accounts, or her reaccounts, and in her experience of, experiences of what she dealt with during the Holocaust and at that concentration camp. And in this book, she tells the story of the power of forgiveness. She tells the story where she was in Munich, Germany, and she was teaching to a group of people in this church. And, and she had just arrived there from Holland to a defeated Germany, and it was in 1947. And she felt like God gave her a message to speak to the people, which was that God forgives. And as she's telling people the story, she says she, as she's talking about forgiveness, she sees a gentleman in the back of the room with his gray overcoat and brown hat, and she recognized him. Service was dismissed, people were filing out, and this gentleman started making his way up to the front to speak to her. And she says, in that moment, that man went from a gray overcoat to a blue uniform with, scross, with, cro, uh, with skull crossbones on a visored cap. She recognized that man as one of the guards in the concentration camp that she was in. And all of a sudden, a flood of emotions had come back. She said she felt like she was put back in that room, the, the warehouse with these overshadowing lights. She said she could imagine just seeing these pile of clothes in the middle of the, of the room as she filed, as she would walk by naked in front of this man, as this man had tortured her and her sister and all those that we're experiencing this, this cruelty from this army. And as he made it to the front of the room, she said, he said that the guard said, you mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk. He says, I was a guard in Ravensbrook. And I'm up here to say that I know that God has forgiven me. But I want to, to hear from your lips, would you forgive me? She's faced with this decision. This guard that created all of this hurt and pain within her life that she witnessed her, her, her sister even die at the hands of these people. And now she's at a place where this man is asking for forgiveness. In that moment, she says that she didn't want to do it. She says, God, I can't do it. But this is what she says. She says, for I had to do it. I knew that the message that God, the, the message that God forgives has a prior condition. 
that we forgive those who have injured us. If we don't forgive men their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. And Tracy says, I stood there with this coldness clutching my heart. And I love what she said. She says, forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that. Forgiveness is an act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. And this is what she says. She says, Jesus, help me. She said, I prayed this silently. She says, I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And she, so she goes on to say that as that man's hand was reached out, she mechanically just thrusted her hand into his hand. And she said, as she did that, this incredible feeling came upon her from her shoulder down through her arm into her hand. And she experienced this healing warmth that flooded her whole being, brought her to tears. And she said, I forgive you, brother. She said she cried. And she says, I forgive you with all my heart. She said, for a long moment, they embraced hands. The former prisoner and the former God. And she goes on to say, I never, I had never known God's love so intensely as I did in that moment. It's the power of forgiveness. This woman that had every right to say, no, how could I forgive you? Look what you did to my family. She lost her family in this concentration camp. But it was through the power of forgiveness, with God's strength, that she was able to do this. And Corey Ten Boone's story has become a powerful example of forgiveness, even in the face of unexpeak unexpeakable atrocities. It reminds us that forgiveness is not just this noble act, but it's a deeply healing one that can bring about reconciliation and peace, even in the midst of the most difficult circumstances that we will ever walk through. It's Calvary forgiveness, if you think about it. As Jesus hung up on the cross, he said, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. These guards that beat, that crucified him in this moment. We need to learn to have that type of forgiveness, but honestly, it only comes within his strength. If you remember, Peter asked Jesus, he says, Jesus, when someone wrongs me, he says it in Matthew 18, he says, how often you know, should, I, uh, should I forgive them? Seven times, this is his thing. He's like, man, I'm, seven times should we just forgive this person? And what does Jesus say? He says, no, not seven times, but what does he say? Seven times 70. What is that, seven times 70? 490. 490 is what really, if you look at it, 490. And sometimes we think, man, 490 times if someone wrongs me, you gotta forgive them. But I don't think it means that. I love it how C.S. Lewis put it. He says it's forgiving one offense 490 times. Because we've all been there where we say, man, I yeah, I forgive you. You, you think you've, you've let go of it. You've let go of the hurt, the pain. You think I've forgiven them. And then all of a sudden someone brings it up in a conversation and you can start to feel it inside again. 490, I gotta forgive him. Maybe it's something you're driving by a location of a, of a church and you're like, you thought you had forgiven him. But all of a sudden, you've driven by and you feel all of that pain, all of those emotions, all of that all just like encompassing and starting to consume you again. What do you got to do? It's 490. Every time, every time it comes up, forgiveness with God's strength, you've got to do the 490 principle. You've got to go 490 on it. I've got to forgive him. Okay. All right. Next day. Okay. I'm going to forgive him. I'm going to forgive I'm going to forgive. I've got to forgive because as you are forgiving, it's creating you whole again every single time. Why do we forgive? Because God forgave us. Forgiveness is not easy, but it is biblical. And it's totally necessary for healing to take place. 
Now, forgiveness doesn't mean that you excuse the person's behavior. It doesn't mean that you just jump back into a, a relationship with them and you trust them all over again. It doesn't mean that you have to make all these amends. But what it does is forgiveness is you letting go of the bitterness and the anger and the pain. It might mean not even you ever having a relationship with them again. Forgiveness is not saying that you have to have a relationship with them or even go back to that church. But what it is is saying, I'm letting go. I'm trusting you, God, with this. The third thing in the way that we can position ourselves to experience God's healing is this, that don't give up on the church. That's the first thing that we always want to do when we experience hurt in church is that we just want to give up on the church. Too often times, though, we associate the people of the church, the imperfect people, which is all of us, to Christ's perfection. There's only one that's perfect. And yes, there is a higher standard that ministers and pastors are held to. James 3 tells us that not many of you should do this. But it goes on to say in the very next verse, in verse 2, he says, but we will make mistakes. But if you've experienced pain and heartache and shame, I want to let you know that that is not God's intentions for the church. But what happens is that we give up on it. And that's exactly Satan's plan, to steal, kill, destroy. Satan's plan is to keep you stuck, hurt, isolated. But God's plan is to bring healing, restoration, and bring you back into the community because we were all created for community. We were created in his likeness, and Genesis tells us that we were created in the likeness. It says, let us make man in our image, talking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so he created us as community beings and to bear the image of Christ. And I truly believe that the church is the hope of the world. It's the reason why Allison and I ventured out to plant a church, because we want to see communities change. We want to see people's lives change. We want to see people understanding their God-given purpose so that ultimately one day that they will meet their maker, their creator, who is perfect, and that we will spend eternity with him. And through my involvement in church ministry over these 20 years, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, but more than often, I have seen the overwhelmingly good that takes place in the house of God when people gather together who are like-minded that can see the purpose that God has for each and every single person that walks through these doors, embraces God's love to be a part of their life. And again, it's heartbreaking when people will just give up on the church and miss out on the growth and the healing and the restoration that take, can take place of being a part of a healthy community. If you've been hurt, you've got to let God heal that hurt. It's time to deal with the church hurt, that you can love Jesus and you can love the church again. Because the church, the assembling of believers, this gathering, it's who Jesus is coming back for is what Ephesians is saying. He's coming back for the bride of Christ. You know, I know not many of you, we're all still getting to know each other, but this lady right here on the front row, my wife, she means everything to me. She is the most amazing person. Like, I have my kids, I love my kids, but she's number one. Kids are, you know, two, three, four, you know, they're down the line. <laughs> And that can be a whole topic in itself because honestly, some people reverse that order and put their kids before their spouse. But in order to have a godly household and a strong household, you've got to, per, you've got to put your spouse. And I love her and will do anything for her. But could you imagine if someone came up to me and said, all right, man, I love you, man. Man, you're awesome. Man, you are incredible. I love just hanging around you. But Allison, uh-uh. I can't, I can't get along with her. Like, I, I don't want anything to do with Allison. Like, you, yes, you're awesome, you're amazing. You're like, but now I, I actually hate her. Do you think we would have a problem? Like, there would be a little bit of an issue. She's my bride. Is she perfect? Pretty close, but <laughs> there are some faults. Like she still doesn't know directions and we've lived in the valley for over 20 years and she calls me. (laughs) There's still some faults, but I love her with every fiber of my being. 
does the church have faults? Yeah. It does. But does Jesus love the church with every fiber of his being? Yes, he does. So could I encourage you here today? No matter what you've walked through. Sorry. I'm sorry for the pain that it's caused you. I'm sorry that it's cast a negative perception of maybe who God can be in your life. I'm sorry that it's held you back. that the enemy has been able to keep you sidelined. His plan to steal, kill, and destroy maybe has been evident in your life. But I want to tell you that he has come to give you life and life to the fullest. We could just let go. Acknowledge Yes, I have been hurt. Maybe we would let go and say, God, I need to forgive with your strength. I need to go 490 on some of these issues within my life. I can't be just a one-time thing, but it's got to be something that I'm continually doing. And more importantly, that you would find yourself re-engaging and not giving up on the church. And here's the reason why is because as much as I believe that as much as I believe that you need the church, the church needs you. We need you. We need you. Because we are the bride of Christ together, united, standing firm for his purpose and his plan is to see people saved and redeemed because the church is the hope of the world and we can be a beacon of light and I know that there are bad churches out there and they give a misrepresentation of what the church should be but we can be a church that stands upon his word that understands who he's called us to be that understands community that there may be some times there may be some things that we get things wrong but we're willing to bear with each other we're willing to have grievances to work through things so that we can be a better person and experience the healing that he's called us to can we be the church? Can we be his church? I want to pray for us today. If you just stand up to your feet today. And I know as we're talking about forgiveness. It's a hard one. I think most of us have probably experienced some sort of hurt. Again, whether it be unintentionally or whether it was just pure evil. I just want to pray that we would come to a point where if you have not acknowledged it, that you should, because that's the first step to healing but Then as you process through it, and some of you today, it's not going to just happen right now. Maybe you need to talk to a counselor. Maybe you need to talk to a trusted person. Maybe you just need a journal today, later this evening. Maybe you just need to find a place and just process those emotions. But then you find yourself at a place that you say, God, with your strength, I'm going to forgive. And then don't give up on the church. We're here for you. This church right here is here for you. We're not perfect by any means. But we will continue to seek the heart of God. Pursue after him wholeheartedly. 
and begin to see what God has in store for this church community as well as individuals. We ask you just to close your eyes. I just want to pray. If there's anyone in here that says, all right, you pray for me because I've experienced some pain within my life. I need to acknowledge that I have been hurt and I've been holding on to it. I might be here today, you've been coming to church, but in all honesty, you've held tightly to that hurt. And the enemy has been able to sideline you. If that's you, if you just raise your hand so I just know who I'm praying for. You be seated. I see these hands. God, you see these hands here today. And you know their pain. You've identified with their struggle. But God, today I pray that this message here would be the first steps to healing that maybe they've not encountered yet in their life. And so God, I pray with your strength, they would walk through this process so they can experience the true freedom that you have come to give. We thank you that you are a God that loves us. So God, we give it to you. We surrender it to you. And we ask you, God, to heal the broken pieces, mend our broken hearts, give strength in the moments of difficulty, and bring peace when the enemy tries to lie over our minds. Give us a peace. Say that I'm walking his purpose, his promise. God, I also pray for any person in here that maybe has never completely surrendered their life to you. God, I pray that they would come to a place to this understanding that A, they can admit, God, that they're in need of a savior, that they're here, but they don't really have a relationship with you. That once and for all of experiencing pain and different things in life, that they're willing to admit that they need you, God. Secondly, be God, that they would believe, as simple as that, God, that they would believe that you love them, that you died on the cross from what we did during communion was a representation of remembering the price that you paid so that we did not have to. And then lastly, see, God, that they would confess with their mouth for you to be their Lord and their Savior. I pray, God, if there's anyone in that moment right now, God, they would utter those words, God, I need you. Forgive me. Please be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, we thank you. In your mighty name we pray. We thank you for the healing. Thank you for the peace. And we thank you for the strength. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, church. We're gonna get ready to dismiss here in just a moment, but I'm gonna have a few of our prayer team members come up. And we're just gonna be playing something softly here, and I know as people are making their way out, there may be some of you in here today that part of your acknowledgement is that you just need someone to pray with you. And we wanna do that here this morning. And all of these matters are private. They're not going anywhere, but we want to provide a safe place for you just to walk through those things, to acknowledge those things, but then also that they can pray with you, that you will have the strength as he has promised in the context of prayer to be able to forgive. So we love you guys. We thank you for joining us. We pray as you leave, if you prayed that prayer, stop by our information center because we want to come alongside you in that journey of being a disciple, but we also want to offer this time for prayer. So we love you guys. Have a great week, and we look forward to seeing you next weekend. God bless.